Okay, so we are going to cover chapter 36. Wow, we're really getting up there. Disorders of neuromuscular function. So that's where we have, so neuromuscular indicates neuro and then muscular. So we're, it, it's usually most of the pathologies with the exception of muscular dystrophy, most of these pathologies are, are going to be neuro related and uh, the muscles really don't get involved. They're just being told what to do. And in, in most of these, the, the muscles are, or the, uh, the neurons are what's, what's affected. So, um, so gross meaning, meaning large movements and then fine motor, motor movements, uh, which are a little more, uh, well, they're a little more fine, um, should be purposeful. Uh, smooth and coordinated. So purposeful means that we're doing what we're what we plan on doing. If you're going to pick up a coffee cup, you're able to you know wrap your fingers around the handle and that kind of thing. Um, smooth and coordinated. We don't want to dump the coffee all over the place. So um, and and of course you know when you're talking about pathologies, a lot of times that's what happens. It's you're still able to move, uh, but you're not you don't have that that fine control that you need to. Um, to uh, to make a, a coordinated movement um, with with some dexterity, so strong and equal bilaterally. So that means one side should be able to move about the same as the other side. Okay, so and of course you know that's when we're getting into neuronal damage on one side versus the other. Okay, so requires coordination of muscles, nerves, joints, balance, and sensation. So we have to get all of the feedback constantly and, uh, and, and get all of that stuff coordinated the way that it's supposed to be. So problems arrive obviously with no movement and then with purposeless movement. That doesn't mean that you, you know, you went to the kitchen and you forgot why you were going there and you have no purpose now. That means that when you're, when you're a movement that you didn't plan on making, or, or a movement that you plan on making that just that just didn't didn't work out. Okay, all right. So the neuromuscular junction is the first place that we'll start thinking about this, and and of course it starts in the in the brain. So this is this is a brain. Okay, so those are supposed to show the little sulci and gyruses, gyri, whatever. Uh, and so so that those you have neurons that come down, and they come down primarily through the spinal cord, unless you're talking about facial muscles and things like that, but uh, they come down through the spinal cord, and then they exit through the th through the spinal nerve. So you have your your vertebrae all along here, and so they're exiting between these vertebrae, and then um, and then they're going to go to the muscle. Okay, so this is kind of kind of what we see here is that neuron that then is going to the muscle, and then it's activating it. So this this is showing a motor unit, and uh, I don't know if you remember what a motor unit is. But a motor unit can be, you know, you can have a really large motor unit that controls a large part of the muscle. So that means this one neuron is, is activating, in this case, that entire part of the part of the muscle. Now you can have large motor units like we have in our in the large muscles of our leg, because you don't need a lot of fine-tuned control on those. You just are either activating them or not. But in our face, we make facial expressions, so we have a little bit smaller motor motor units. Okay, so that's not that's not super important. Uh, I think it's most important just that you understand that the neuron is activating the muscle, and it can activate different size, different parts, or uh, different quantities, I guess, of the muscle. Okay, so so the neurotransmitter that we we need to worry about is acetylcholine. That's handy because, well, we're also going to talk about dopamine at one point, but um, but acetylcholine is the one that is released onto the muscle, onto nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and then that causes depolarization of the muscle, and that's kind of what we see here. We see all these little synapse, or these little uh, synaptic vesicles, and they have acetylcholine in them, and then that acetylcholine, when the the, uh, the motor neuron sends the signal and depolarizes the depolarizes that that terminal, then you're going to release acetylcholine. And these little dots here are acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so that's what those guys are. So it releases it onto the receptor, and then it causes the muscle to depolarize, and then the actin and the myosin. Remember the myosin heads walk along the actin filaments and you have muscle contraction. Okay, so that's when everything is working the way it's supposed to. Okay, so acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors. Okay, well that's pretty handy. We have acetylcholine that you can see in here and that's just what I was showing you. And then, so so now the acetylcholine has been released, so we'll we'll make it out here. I guess we could even we could even make it green like it was inside there. So the acetylcholine 
has been released and some of it's going to come down and bind to the receptor and then of course it bounces off and it just keeps binding and activating that receptor as long as it's there. So we don't want to just release acetylcholine and just have it live in the, in the synaptic cleft forever. We want to get rid of it. And in the case of acetylcholine, it's broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Okay, so acetylcholinesterase is just an enzyme, it breaks it down, it breaks it into choline and acetic acid, makes it so it doesn't work anymore, and then all of that acetylcholine goes away and everything works perfectly. And then, then if you want to activate that muscle again, you can. Okay? So, um, so we're going we're gonna to come back to that in just a second. Like I said, most of these are neuromuscular, but here's this muscular dystrophy, and we have to talk about muscular dystrophy just because most people have heard of it. And so it's, it's kind of out there as a, uh, as a, I won't say common, most, most pathologies aren't necessarily common, but, it's, but it's, uh, it affects a number of people. So what muscular dystrophy is, and like I said, it's muscular, it's not neuro muscular. So what it is is just the muscles are breaking down. So the so um, it's a uh, well we'll just we'll just read the definition here it refers to a number of disorders that produce progressive degeneration and necrosis of skeletal muscle. Okay, so skeletal muscle fibers. It's usually X-linked. And hopefully by now when I say X-linked, you automatically think, okay, so it's in boys more than girls. Because remember, girls have a backup X chromosome. Girls, females in general, have a backup X chromosome. So boys only have one. So if there's something wrong with one of the genes on a boy's X chromosome, well, they don't have a backup. A girl does. So in this case, if the girl has the, you know, has the muscular dystrophy gene, well, you know what? Her, her, her other one will make the right thing. Okay, so they're usually X-linked, uh, result with a mutation of a gene for a protein called dystrophin, which was named after the disease, muscular dystrophy. That was part of the research they did. They finally located the gene and the gene product, which is a protein called dystrophin. And what that does is it attaches the actual muscle, so the actin myosin, it actually attaches the myosin to the membrane to the to the uh, cell membrane, which you think about it, that kind of has to happen. So we call the cell membrane the sarcolemma. That that kind of has to happen. Otherwise, otherwise, it's just not going to you know the muscle is going to contract and it's going to I don't know scrape along the membrane. Um, but ultimately, without that dystrophin, without that attachment, the muscle cell will die. Okay, so so it doesn't it can't survive that and it just sort of slowly progresses and little by little dies. Okay, so there are different mutations that affect muscles differently. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy causes near complete loss of dystrophin. So there there isn't any of this protein. Okay, so they can they might be able to detect a tiny bit, but but it's just essentially gone. And there's another one called Becker muscular dystrophy. It's just a mutation of the same same protein, but in a or same gene but in a different place so it makes some of the dystrophin so but it's a diminished amount so those are gonna those are going to uh, present differently in terms of uh, in terms of symptoms and severity okay so now we'll jump back to the neuromuscular junction so we just learned everything there is to know about the neuromuscular junction kind of we learned some so here again are synaptic vesicles and they have the acetylcholine in them and the acetylcholine is pulled down by something called snare and snap proteins so it's pulled down and then it releases that acetylcholine so that's what's going on and then the acetylcholine binds to the receptor i know we already went over this but it kind of works into this slide because we have a couple of different things botulinum toxin blocks the release. So it blocks the ability for these synaptic vesicles to even get down there and sort of fuse with the membrane and release the acetylcholine. That doesn't happen. Okay, So these guys just sort of sit in there and that's going to stop neurotransmission. It's going to render that muscle, depending on how much botulinum toxin you put in there, but it's going to render it dead. And so a lot of times there are botulinum toxin injections and you have to, it's very, very potent. The toxin is very potent, so you can't use very much of it. But it, um, 
but it's in, injected into certain areas, like people with um, uh, when when their eyes don't don't line up the way they're supposed to. A lot of times, that'll be injected to sort of get that um, get their to to sort of deaden that muscle that maybe is pulling one eye that causes a rotation of the eye, kind of pulls it in one direction too much. So you can deaden that. Of course, we've all heard of um, of the uh, preventing wrinkles, so it does the same thing. It kind of deadens the muscle. The muscle isn't able to be activated anymore. And so that apparently cuts down on wrinkles somehow. And um, and then I think it's been used for like to prevent sweating, things like that. So any anything, and there are there are other examples too that I'm not that I'm not thinking of at the moment. Okay, so that's decreased acetylcholine release and botulinum toxin is a good example of that. Now, decreased acetylcholine effects on the muscle cell. Well, that's another one. That's one that we're just getting ready to talk to talk about. It's on the next slide. And that's a disease called myasthenia gravis. So now what happened is the acetylcholine was released. Okay, so effects on the muscle cell. So that means the nerve's fine, or the neuron. It's fine, releases the acetylcholine, but something is keeping it from activating the muscle. In the case of this drug called Karari, it blocks the receptor. So it just kind of, so we can just sort of see that it sort of sits there. It's an antagonist. It sits there and then when the acetylcholine goes to bind, it says, oh, it's occupied and it leaves. Okay, so that means it's not going to be able to um, activate it. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder that we're going to talk about next, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but that actually destroys the receptor. So without a receptor, you're obviously not going to have binding. You're not going to have activation of the muscle. That looks like a smiley face. Okay, so um, decreased acetylcholinesterase activity. So remember that acetylcholine was released and then we have to get rid of it. So here's all this acetylcholine in here. We need to get rid of it. So we break it down with that that enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And acetylcholinesterase is you need to know that because um, if you decrease the amount of acetylcholinesterase, think about what happens. Okay, so think about this for a second. If you decrease the ability for to for the synaptic cleft for the synapse to get rid of the acetylcholine, what you're doing is you're leaving it in here for a longer period of time, and that's going to increase activation. Okay. So if you decrease acetylcholinesterase, you're going to increase activation of the of the uh, of the muscle. So it results in acetylcholine having a stronger effect on the muscle cell. Okay, so organophosphates from pesticides can block it, and but we don't really care. Well, I mean we care about that, but in terms of you know clinical applications, there are a lot of drugs that based on on chemicals uh, that we found in various ways that block acetylcholinesterase activity. Okay, so they so they block the acetylcholinesterase, which increases binding, which increases the acetylcholine activity. Okay? Does that does that make sense? Because because you know there's one of the only uh, well I don't know about anymore, but one of the first uh, Alzheimer's disease drugs was actually based on this. It blocked acetylcholine and increased or blocked acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme, and it increased acetylcholine activity. Okay, so hopefully that that kind of makes sense. All right, myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease. So we just mentioned that it's an autoimmune disease, and it it really just sort of breaks down the neuromuscular junction, but it. The main way that there are a couple of ways it does it, but the main way that it does it is by killing. Okay, so I don't know. It's the immune system. It's violent, but it wipes out acetylcholine receptors. Okay. Now, if you tell your muscle to contract, and you don't have enough acetylcholine receptors, you can see normal here on the left, and then the diseased on the right. If you don't have enough acetylcholine receptors, you're going to interpret that as, as my brain is telling my muscle to contract and my muscle is not contracting as much as I want it to. So, so what does that mean? That means that 
um, that's going to to come as or that's going to be that's going to present as muscle weakness okay so gradual development of weakness and easily fatigued okay because you're going to have to activate it more you're going to have to activate the motor neurons more to get some kind of a response okay and it's and uh, this is autoimmune so it just kind of continues to uh, destroy these so it can be progressive as well okay so it's a uh, complement mediated injury to postsynaptic muscle membrane um, and then acetylcholine receptors are destroyed and uh, so these antibodies bind to the receptor sites, to the receptors, and then and then uh, block them and destroy them ultimately. So um, the way the way that it that it progresses. Okay, so we'll slow down here for a second. The way that it progresses is from proximal to distal portions of the body. Um, so proximal meaning meaning closer to the central nervous system, and then it and then it moves distally. Okay. Um, so often, and so this is one of the first signs, symptoms that, that people will uh, present with is eye movement. So eye movement is one of the first things that you'll see, and there may be some, a little bit of fatigue and some weakness as well. Um, myasthenia crisis, well, you know, the immune system isn't necessarily going to be selective about this. And if it starts affecting uh, respiration, so diaphragm muscle. If it starts affecting that and you're not able to activate your diaphragm muscle to inhale or inspire, if you're not able to do that, then that's, well, that's a crisis. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's not, and, and a lot of these, uh, when they start affecting the diaphragm muscle, that's, that's a lot of times what leads to death. Okay. Um, and, and here we go, there's an anticholinesterase drug. Okay, so that means it's breaking down the enzyme, so the treatment would be to break down the enzyme and leave the acetylcholine that is released in there longer. So even though there aren't as many receptors, it's in there for a longer period of time, and so it can, it can have more, more activity. Okay, now we need to talk about upper and lower motor neurons. This is kind of a, kind of a big deal. And it's not that difficult, but when we start to apply it, it gets kind of interesting. And you might be able to figure it out as, as we go along. Um, as you can probably guess, upper motor neurons, as long as you're standing, upper motor neurons are higher, so they're up in the brain. And then they, they, they move down. So, so the brain is where a, a purposeful movement originates, right? And so it moves down from the brain into the spinal cord. And then it has to synapse, okay? So that means it has to, to kind of communicate with another neuron and then, that, and then move out. So, so a lot of times you'll have the synapse like down here a little bit, you'll have the synapse here and then it, and then it will move out one of these spinal nerves, the, the neuron will, okay? So remember a nerve is just a collection of a whole bunch of neuron axons, okay? So the whole thing together is called a nerve. And then each one of these is a is a neuron, so so you've got the upper neurons and then the lower the lower neurons, and if you just remember that that it's uh, upper motor neurons, the brain originating in the cerebral cortex, and then the lower motor neurons are the ones that actually activate activate the muscle. Okay, so we have upper and lower. Um, so upper motor originate in the motor cortex of the brain. Upper, they send their axons down through the internal capsule. Okay, we don't have a picture of the internal internal capsule, but it's just a region of the brain uh, to the lower motor neurons. The axons run down the white matter of the spinal cord, so we have white matter tracts, and then exit through the spinal nerves to the peripheral nervous system, and every, which is everything outside the brain and the spinal cord. So we're going to talk more about it, and it's gonna, these upper and lower neurons are going to. Uh, come up again, but here's uh, diseases may affect the, either the upper or the lower neurons differently. Okay, so this is where we get to think and we get to sort of guess what might happen. Okay, so if you're following me, if my brain tells my, my bicep muscle, my arm muscle to contract, if my brain tells it to, then it has to go through these upper motor neurons 
um, that originate in the brain. Lower motor neurons are the, is the one that's going to go from my spinal cord out to the muscle. Okay, so let's just let's just jump down here. So neurons originating in the brain, spinal reflexes. Okay, so let's think about how a spinal reflex works. Well, a spinal reflex. Here's a here's kind of a picture of it. Let's see if we can if we can kind of look at that. A spinal reflex means that. So in this case, this person stepped on a tack, and it sent a message out here, and then it sent a message up to the brain. Okay. Okay. So so. This is, this is a reflex. So if we just concentrate on the reflex part, then it never did communicate with the brain for the reflex part, and then it just activated that muscle. I hope that makes sense, because, because what this means is that the upper motor neurons were never involved. Okay? So you can have purposeful movement, but in the case of a reflex, that's not purposeful movement. The brain doesn't matter whether the brain is telling your leg to move or not. This is a reflex. So what does that mean? That means if you damage your upper motor neurons, okay, which is kind of what we see here, if you damage your upper motor neurons, your reflexes don't really care. Okay. So in fact, there's no way that the brain can even control them. I mean, you can have a reflex that you want to stop or you want to stop the movement. You want to override that reflex, which we can do. But without that upper motor neuron, you don't have that control. So you have increased muscle tone, which means a partial contraction. So you're going to have more of a contraction because the brain's not over to, able to override this feedback system. Hyperreflexia. So that means your reflexes are going to be um, increased, so hyper. So you're going to have more of a reflex, which can lead to spasticity. Okay, so you could have a spastic muscle. So any kind of little signal that activates that reflex arc is going to be uncontrolled. And here's the other thing. Think about, think about this. It says resistance to movement, which may not mean very much. You may just be thinking, oh, well, that means when I try to move somebody's arm and they have upper motor neuron damage, that you know it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be a little bit resistance. Well, resistant, yeah, because you have you know things in there like muscle spindles that are going to detect a stretch that it didn't plan on and so that's going to cause that muscle to to contract a little bit. Now move over just just keeping that in mind. So so you have a, a patient, somebody, and you and you move their arm and they resist. Okay, so there's muscle resistance. Now if you say, okay, well if somebody has lower motor neuron damage, those are the muscle, those are the neurons that are actually going to the muscle. Okay, the lower motor neurons are the ones that are going, that are communicating with the, with the muscle directly. If you have damage to that, there's not going to be any movement at all. There's not anything that's activating that muscle. The neuron to activate it is gone. So you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have any kind of spinal reflexes. You're going to have flaccid paralysis. So there isn't going to be any resistance to movement because there are no neurons to activate the muscles. okay, uh, And then, of course, you'll have denervation, atrophy of muscles. Now, you'll have atrophy even if it's, a, even if it's upper motor neuron as well, um, but it will, it will not be as, as rapid. So denervation and atrophy of muscles is going to take place because they're never being told to activate as long as you have complete damage of those, those lower motor neurons. Okay, so uh, to the pathology of it, ALS, which is uh, amyolateral sclerosis, um, Lou Gehrig's disease usually involves, and we'll, we'll talk about that, usually involves both upper and lower, but it can be one or the other. Spinal cord injury, same thing. It could damage either either one or both. Uh, I will say that uh, even, even ALS, where they think it's upper, they also find lower damage sometimes. Okay, but we're not too worried about that. Okay, so peripheral nerve injury. So remember the periphery is outside, so the brain and the spinal cord, that's a brain and spinal cord, that's your central nervous system. Okay, Your peripheral nervous system is where those spinal nerves exit and that's your peripheral nervous system out here. Okay, so um, peripheral nerve injuries may cause damage to motor and sensory branches of somatic and visceral nervous system. Okay, what does that mean? 
that means that you're trying to communicate sensory information in and motor information out and so and that can include both somatic which means your conscious directed control motor control and visceral that means also uh, information going to the gut okay okay or organs all right so what are you going to guess that's involved? You're going to guess that they're lower motor neurons. Okay, motor, motor neurons, cell bodies in the spinal cord. Um, so, um, so an injury could cause damage to that. Um, myelin sheath. So demyelinating diseases um, are also are also going to can be included in this category of peripheral nerve injuries. Okay, so anything that's anything that's out here not in the CNS. So we're going to talk about a couple mononeuropathy. Mono, of course, means one, and uh, that's damage to a single peripheral nerve. Okay, so carpal tunnel syndrome is the example that we'll that we'll talk about. Usually caused by localized conditions such as trauma, compression, infection. Okay, so that's something that is 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 affecting that one single nerve for for whatever reason polyneuropathy so that's where we start to get into this demyelination okay? uh, demyelination or axonal degeneration of multiple peripheral nerves okay so that's less likely to be caused by uh, trauma and that's that's a lot of times uh, caused by well in this case the example we're going to talk about uh, Guillain Barre Guillain Barre syndrome um, is is a uh, a uh, demyelinating disease. So symmetric sensory motor or mixed sensory motor deficits. So either sensory, motor, or both can be affected. Longest axons in this case, um, especially with the uh, Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, let's see. Yeah, so that's the lo longest axons affected first, uh, progressing distal to progressing distal to proximal. So that means it's going to start out in the feet, uh, in the legs, and then it's going to move toward t closer to the central nervous system. So range of causes, immune mechanisms, toxic agents, and metabolic diseases. So immune is uh, is pretty common, and toxins, you never know what they're going to do, and then uh, uh, other diseases that we'll, we'll kind of talk about. So first one, car carpal tunnel syndrome. It's a mononeuropathy which means that it's affecting a nerve and in this case it's affecting the median nerve okay so what's really cool about about your wrist so in here in your wrist is you have this transverse carpal ligament that kind of goes across the top to hold all of this stuff down and then you have a whole bunch of tendons so when you when you close your hand there are a bunch of tendons that are going through a tunnel Okay, so it's surrounded by the bones of the wrist, and then you have this, what, what they're calling a tunnel, and they call it the carpal tunnel. And so the tendons are fine. The trouble is, I mean, you want it there, but the trouble is that you've got this median nerve that also goes through the same area. Now, usually it's fine, um, but for whatever reason, and here's a whole list of possible causes, is that you have compression of that median nerve. And when you have compression of the median nerve, the neurons, some of the neurons within that nerve, some of the axons, will stop transmitting. They won't be able to transmit their signal. And so that usually, usually when, when it can't transmit a signal away, it's, it's going to be some kind of a weakness. But when it can't transmit that signal back, sensory information, then it's going to be sensory so numbness or tingling or something like that okay so it's just compression um, the things that can cause this to happen inflammation of the carpal tunnel well there's the carpal tunnel yeah you can imagine any kind of inflammation uh, can can cause compression of that of that median nerve wrist injury that makes sense repetitive motion is one that's pretty common um, so repetitive motion, flexion, extension, movements, and stress associated with pinching and gripping motions. Okay, so that can um, that can simply the movement can somehow uh, damage that area and maybe cause an an infl inflammation in that in that region. Okay, so associated, and these are some of the uh, 
the systemic diseases that we kind of mentioned earlier, associated with many systemic diseases, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, acromegaly, which is, which is just excess growth hormone, and, uh, and hyper, hyperthyroidism. So for whatever reason, these guys will cause an increase in the incidence of, um, of carpal tunnel syndrome. It's also a little more prevalent in, in females probably in the guesses probably because it's a it's a smaller area anybody who has this um, in general it tends to have a smaller carpal tunnel to begin with and then and so that, that which kind of makes sense if you have less room to begin with then any kind of inflammation any kind of damage is going to uh, affect that median nerve more more aggressively okay so manifestations weak finger thumb pinch okay so weakness and then numbness. So you've got motor, which is going to make sense. Your neuron is your nerve isn't working right. Some of the neurons aren't working right within that nerve. And then numbness of thumb in digits two to three in the medial front aspect of um, or inner. So the medial aspect of four. All right. So this is the polyneuropathy that we mentioned. So remember, um, carpal tunnel syndrome was a mono. Neuropathy. This is a polyneuropathy, and this is immune myelinate, immune mediated demyelination. Now, a lot of, we haven't talked about it yet. We haven't talked about what myelin is, but multiple sclerosis is another demyelinating disease. So, really, the myelin sheaths are just sort of around, and we could get into all the physiology of how they work. It's pretty cool, but really, they just surround the neuron, and then they cause faster. Uh, neural nerve transmission um, so down the axon so they cause your they cause your signal to move more more quickly faster okay so when these guys start to break down which is kind of what you see in this picture here so when the myelin starts to break down then you don't have you don't have as fast of conduction okay and that can that can you know in some cases lead to death of the neuron um, but in the case of uh, Guillain Barr syndrome, GBS. It's, I don't know, Barre. Sorry, my French is rusty. Uh, so, so, in that case, in the case of GBS, it really, it kind of is acute. So, MS, let's, let's pause for a second here because this is what I was talking about. MS is also demyelinating. The difference is that GBS is peripheral. First of all, we haven't talked about MS, but we'll find out that it's primarily in the central nervous system. Okay, so GBS is peripheral, and GBS tends to be more acute. Okay, so the cause when it sets in is is also different. So these are these are different diseases, even though they're both demyelinating diseases. Cause is unknown, but this is interesting two-thirds of the cases follow an acute viral infection. So that means there's probably some kind of protein in the virus. So this could be Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, there are a number of them. There's something about that virus that activates the immune system in some people and that their immune system will get confused and it will start to attack the myelin. So that's, that's, that's what that indicates. Two-thirds of the cases follow an acute viral infection. So something is turning up the, the immune system and it's turning on, on itself. Okay, like turning on itself, like, like it's attacking itself, not turning itself on. Okay, so characterized by rapid progressive ascending paralysis. Rapid, it's key. Progressive, okay, so it's going to get worse. Ascending, so that means it starts distally and it moves proximal. So, and loss of tendon reflexes starts in the hands and the feet tingly. So you'll feel sensory, you feel tingly, and you, uh, you have what I guess people would refer to as rubbery legs. I think we all know what that means, um, but usually that's after we're, we're really tired or something. So there's no cure, but resolution may, be, may progress in a descending order. And, and people will recover to different, to different levels. I mean, some people will have this and then they'll recover 100% and be, and be just fine. Other people may still have some um, lasting effects. Um, yeah, so, so one of the things to do is just to get rid of the autoantibodies. Okay, so autoant 
it's it's immune, so antibodies are attacking the myelin, so let's get rid of them, and that's called plasmapheresis, which is where you remove your plasma that has the antibodies, and then you put in a donor plasma that doesn't have the antibodies, and that's going to, to kind of stop that. It's usually presents as a medical emergency, and so treatment besides the plasmapheresis is support of, of vital, uh, vital functions. Okay, and you hope it doesn't doesn't affect uh, diaphragm. Okay, uh, autonomic nerves are also affected, and this is something that we're going to keep coming back to: is the autonomic nervous system. Remember, the autonomic nervous system you have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is fight or flight, and the parasympathetic is rest and digest. We're going to keep coming back to that because when it comes to spinal cord injury and neuronal injuries, one of the things that uh, especially healthcare people need to be very aware of is that this is going to have effects that aren't just motor and sensory. So this is so this can affect the blood pressure. Okay, so you could see tachycardia. Okay. So so this this does affect these these vital functions. Okay. So that's that's something, and, and any kind of uh, neuronal damage uh, has the potential, and we'll we'll talk more about that. Unfortunately, it's one of the last slides where we really dive into that. So uh, hopefully, the next time you go through this, it'll make sense, more sense. All right, let's see. There was something I was going to say about this, and I can't remember what it was. It wasn't that important. It was just interesting. Okay, so back pain. Uh, let's see, we'll just start down here where it says affects two-thirds of people in their lifetime. I think we know what back pain is. It's pain in the back. And there are a lot of different things that can cause it. Um, so we're going to call it peripheral. So peripheral nerve injury at the spinal nerve roots. So that's, I have a very tiny picture down here. And you can see the nerve roots down here where the nerves move out of the spinal cord. So any kind of damage to those uh, can cause pain often due to compression of a nerve root by vertebrae or the vertebral disc. So we'll talk about that with bulged and herniated discs in a, in a second. So, our, but there are a range of causes. Vertebrae and vertebral joints, which is kind of, you know, the vertebrae down here. Uh, back muscles and ligaments, so that can, cause, that can cause pain as well. Disorders of the spinal nerve roots. Okay. So some kind of infection or, or some, some other disease or reduced blood flow or something like that. Spinal stenosis. So stenosis, remember, means narrowing. So if you have spinal stenosis, then that means that the space where that spinal nerve is coming out may not have enough room, and so it may become compressed. Uh, herniated discs, we'll talk about that specifically. But most common injuries and age-related degenerative changes. So especially in the in the lower lumbar area, because you you bend a lot there, uh, it's a little more it's a little more flexible. So you have more movement in that area. It carries a lot of weight. So so that can kind of you know over time that can that can break down. So age-related degenerative changes in the intervertebral discs and the facet joints. And we'll look at a picture of that in a second. So maybe a manifestation of a more serious pathological problem. So five to ten percent. So usually not, but it's something you need to be aware of. So a lot of people that come in with back pain, it may not be their back, or it may be their back, but it may be a little more serious. But keep in mind that that's that's rare, or reasonably rare. Um, so here's some red flags: gradual onset of pain. Well, you know, rapid onset of pain is usually an injury. Uh, gradual onset of pain, you're not really sure. You know, if it just kind of keeps getting worse and worse and worse, it could be degenerative, but it could also be a tumor or something like that. So there could be something that's growing and then causing a progressive damage in that area. So it's something to, to keep in mind. Age younger than 20, so you shouldn't have any kind of degeneration before the age of 20. Older than 55, which is kind of interesting because a lot of times people will have back pain, um, especially I would say in, in nursing homes or something like that. They'll complain of back pain, and then it turns out one of their vertebrae is broken. Okay, So, I mean, that's pretty common. The, uh, the, the 
bone, the bone will break down, osteoporosis, the bone will break down and then becomes more brittle and they, there could actually be a fracture and, and they may just, you know, feel a little bit of pain or feel some pain and that's something to look at. Thoracic pain, yeah, you shouldn't have thoracic pain necessarily, you may, but when you start moving away from the back then you start to question other things like an abdominal aneurysm or something like that. Um, I know somebody who had back pain for a while, went to the doctor for it, and they had testicular cancer. It, it, for whatever reason, it was just presenting to that individual as, um, as back pain. So fever, chills, night sweats, so now we're getting into uh, signs of infection, systemic infection, and then weight loss, so loss of appetite, anorexia, weight loss. All right, so herniated disc. The nucleus pulposus, whatever that is. Okay, so what it is, is it's the inside part of this disc. It's a jelly-like substance that has some collagen and water, and uh, but it's a jelly-like substance that's supposed to make it a little more, that disc a little more pliable, but it can squeeze out through the membrane that's supposed to be holding it in. So, so that's what a herniation is, right? A herniation is when something kind of pushes out to an area where it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be contained within that and it's pushing out. So through the annulus fibrosus, which is what we see here, so that's supposed to be surrounding it completely, but it has herniated and it's moved out. So causing irritation of the dorsal membrane and compression of the nerve root. So here's the nerve root moving out there. Uh, this is cauda equina, so that's the lower lumbar because that's, that's the cauda equina is this thing that looks like a horse's tail. Okay, so, but that's where, that's where the effect is, is usually going to be found. So basically the spinal cord is right there, but we're mostly worried about this, well not mostly, but, but where most of the pain happens and where it's presenting most of the time is in that spinal, that spinal root. Okay, uh, usually occurs at lower levels, yeah, lumbar spine, more pressure, more pressure, more bending. Etiologies include age, trauma, trauma is always a Always a possibility. Degenerative disorders, so uh, some of these that we've, we're talking about. Signs and, signs and symptoms localized to the area innervated by compressed nerve root and include pain, which is the most common, numbness, and motor weakness. Now, I personally had a, when I was training for something ridiculous, um, I, I personally had a bulged disc, I assume. I don't know. I didn't really check it for sure. But uh, I had spinal root ir irritation, and I didn't necessarily notice the pain. I think there was pain, I, but what I noticed is, is numbness that started, that started to happen. Okay, so numerous causes, but usually disc herniation or bulging, okay, or spinal stenosis, and that's that narrowing. So what we're saying is that the spinal root, which comes out from the vertebrae, is something is interfering with that. So herniation occurs in the lumbar regions where the weight is being supported and the flexibility is the greatest. So here, what we're, what we're looking at here is all of these little arrows are pointing to different spinal nerves that are coming out from between different vertebrae. Okay, so they're different spinal nerves, so that means they're innervating different areas. And this guy's bent over because these are the dermatomes, okay? So, so the spinal nerves will come down from an originating point and then, and then they, they just kind of innervate all of those areas. So motor and sensory is, is kind of controlled in that area. And he's bent over because it makes sense when you're on all fours. If you stand up, it, 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 doesn't, quite, it doesn't quite line up. So all of this stuff lines up nicely with the, with the vertebrae when you're, when you're over on all fours like that. Okay. So then you even have sacral, it goes to the anal region. Okay, so what the point of this is that you can map it. Now you're not gonna have to, so it's not that you know I'm going to, on an exam, at least not in my class, I'm not gonna show you pictures and say which, which lumbar, uh, which lumbar spinal nerve is this, but you can see how it, how it can, how you could figure out which one it is. 
And uh, I gave the example of myself, and in my case, I had numbness in my toe, and I was able to trace it back. I don't even remember which one it was, probably the L4. Um, but, but I was able to, to trace it based on where the numbness took place. I thought I was never going to be able to use my toe again, but it healed and everything is fine now. So I know that's a relief for everybody. So basal ganglia. So that's, that's um, spinal root irritation, back pain, herniated discs. Okay, so hopefully we understand that. Basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is, it's not a brain region. It is a whole bunch of brain regions. So you can see in this picture, you've got, you've got blue up here, which is kind of the motor cortex. You have the thalamus and you have the midbrain, right, where the substantia nigra and the caudate and all these other brain regions are. And then you have the cerebellum down here. So the basal nucleus is, is a bunch of brain regions, but it's almost like a concept in my mind. It's, it's all of these things are communicating, all of these different brain regions are communicating with each other to give you a, so here it's listed, planning, organizing, coordinating movements, and it does it as you're moving. So your brain is very active in all of these brain regions, and they're just throwing signals back and forth, trying to make all of your movements pur purposeful and smooth. And so, obviously, if you have anything wrong with any of these brain regions or any of these connections, then you're not going to have smooth, purposeful movement, okay? So, I have it defined here as continuous feedback loops in the basal ganglia initiate, inhibit, and modulate movement patterns. So, they're making everything... Um, they're initiating, they're starting the movement, they're changing it, and they're, uh, it affects posture and tone as well. So, so all of this is making sure that you, that you move properly. It does not, so damage to it does not cause paralysis because you're not cutting off neurons to the muscle. You still have that, that, um, that ability to move, but what it usually what usually happens is that it makes it uncoordinated. So uh, anything Huntington's chorea, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Parkinson's, amyolateral sclerosis. All all of these things in some way are affected. So stimulatory facilitate muscle activity like rising from a chair, and there are inhibitory signals that inhibit activity in antagonistic muscles. There's a lot that has to happen for a movement to be perfect, and the basal ganglia are just a whole bunch of brain regions that work together to do just that. Okay, So with so many regions communicating, motor disorders are common, and there are, well there are a whole bunch of them, uh, basal ganglia disorders, we were just talking about the basal ganglia, and that's the, these are the parts of the basal ganglia that's listed here. It doesn't look right, but that's the, these are all these different areas. Uh, dyskinesias, so, um, so uncoordinated movements, akinesias, inability to move, usually the inability to start moving, and it takes a little more effort. Now the two we're going to talk about are Parkinson's disease and ALS. Okay, so here we have our upper motor neurons and our lower motor neurons, which we'll come back to. Parkinson's disease is damage to this little area called the substantia nigra, which sits right in the midbrain, which is right on top of the, the brainstem. And so and that dysfunction of that or death of the neurons in it is what, what results in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so lots of different things can go wrong because there are a lot of different areas but it's a pretty important, important function for, for people. Okay, so Parkinson's, Parkinsonism, Parkinsonism. Syndrome of abnormal movement. Tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, slow movement. Um, it's very, very interesting. I'd like to say way more about it, but I'll try to stick to what we have on the slides. Caused by the destruction of the sub substantia nigra. Your substantia nigra is it's a part of the brain that really it's it's involved in initiating movements and then continuing those movements. Uh, so it's part of the basal ganglia. So it's part of that big feedback mechanism. The substantia nigra in everybody is slowly deteriorating. Neurons are dying in there constantly. And when you lose about 80% of those neurons, that's when you start to show the symptoms of Parkinsonism, okay? which is this tremor rigidity and bradykinesia. So we'll all get substantial. We'll all get 
Parkinson's if you live long enough because everybody's substantia nigra is deteriorating, but it happens at different rates for different people, and that's why people get Parkinson's disease while they're still alive rather than, you know, it being so slow that they'd have to live to 150 to start showing symptoms. Uh, but usually older people, and that's something to keep in mind, usually older people will start showing some of these symptoms just because they're losing neurons in this substantia nigra. Okay, so basal ganglia also influences the autonomic nervous system. So again, we can't forget about the autonomic nervous system. So you often see excessive sweating, sebaceous gland secretion, salivation, um, later orthostatic hypotension, so um, you're laying down, thermal regulation problems, incontinence, dysphagia. So all of these things can, can occur too. It's not, that's the thing to remember, it's not just a movement disorder. It, uh, it, it has other uh, manifestations besides just um, rigidity and movement. So the substantia nigra neurons are primarily dopamine neurons. I know we think of dopamine as being the happy neurotransmitter or whatever, but, um, but it's also very, very important for movement and specifically in this, in this particular area, the substantia nigra, that's what kind of is... Uh, so, so the goal is to replace it. So, so you're not making enough dopamine or you don't have enough dopaminergic neurons. So if you add more dopamine, trouble is dopamine itself doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So you give the precursor to it, which is something called levodopa or L-dopa. And then the L-dopa turns into dopamine, and then you have more dopamine available for the substantia nigra. Okay. All right. ALS, amyolateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. Okay. This is what Stephen Hawking has, if you know who he is. Um, can damage both upper and lower motor neurons, progressive, it, it tends to progress. Stephen Hawking is like 70 some years old and he's had this since he was in his 20s, which usually if you get it younger, it doesn't, um, it doesn't affect you as, as, well, it affects you as badly, but it's, it progresses more slowly, which, which sounds, um, a little contradictory, but that's that's generally the way it is. Usually you don't live past five years after you've been diagnosed, or even a couple of years. It, it usually progresses pretty quickly. Uh, killed Lou Gehrig. He was a baseball player. They named a disease after him. So upper motor neuron damage, loss of motor nuclei of the cerebral cortex. Remember our upper motor neurons? I keep saying it. This is always supposed to be a brain. This is how I draw brains. So the upper motor neurons are the ones coming down from the brain. So weakness, lack of motor control, lo loss of control over spinal reflexes, not loss of spinal reflexes. Okay, so make a note of that. I'm not saying you lose the upper motor neurons, you lose spinal reflexes. You lose control over them. Okay? leading to stiffness and spasticity. That's not that difficult of a concept. If you remember that the spinal reflexes are going you know, to and from down here, you're talking about destruction of the control of it. These guys, your spinal reflexes are still intact okay? from the upper motor neuron damage. However, however, ALS tends to affect both. So lower motor neuron damage, loss of fibers in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Okay, so that's just kind of how the spinal cord looks. Um, and so it's, it's movement in and out of the, uh, so the neurons move in and out of the spinal cord. That's all, all that's all that's saying. Um, so irritation leads to fasciculation or twitching. Decreased firing leads to weakness, denervation, atrophy, and hyporeflexia. Okay? So it's really, really difficult. And you may be thinking that, so, okay, what are the symptoms? It's hard to say. It depends on how progressed, how much it has progressed, and how it's being expressed by that particular person. And so it could be any of these things. So how do you know for sure you, you really... Um, well, you really wouldn't just by just by these just by looking at these things. So there are different types, but overall the cause is unknown. Uh, there are a couple of ideas. It may be too many free radicals. It could be glutamate toxicity, but but it's not it's not known. There is a certain familiar form where you're not able to uh, you're not able to get rid of free radicals, and the free radicals just destroy your neurons. 
Okay, so death usually occurs due to, to, due to deterioration of diaphragm neurons. Usually the people who get this are, are over 50, they're usually older, and then it, and then it um, not that that's older, but they're, they're not in their 20s most of the time. So usually they're in their 50s, and usually once they've been diagnosed, it progresses pretty quickly. Um, so anyone who survives for a long time, for whatever reason, the disease has decided not to affect the diaphragm neurons and also a lot of times swallowing. So if it affects the neurons that go to the esophagus to direct uh, the swallowing process, once those are affected, if you affect both of these, you're on a vent and you're on a feeding tube. Okay, so, so I mean, if you think about that, that's that's where it gets it gets very very serious but as long as it doesn't affect the diaphragm and it doesn't affect the esophagus um, then it's it's uh, well it's still not not pleasant but at least it's not as life-threatening okay multiple sclerosis so we're talking about that we've already talked about demyelinating disease with GBS um, and so this is another demyelinating disease the names of the cells, so oligodendrocytes, which is what this is a picture of. This is a picture down here of oligodendrocytes. And Schwann cells. Schwann cells are in the periphery. Oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system. But these are the guys that are making the myelin. Okay, These are making the myelin sheaths, which this is a better picture than I drew earlier. They're little nodes of Ranvier. Remember that. And so you have that uh, saltatory conduction, and it's very fast. Okay. Um, so myelin increases the speed of neurotransmission, which provides rapid muscle control and sensory feedback. So both directions, we've got muscle control, we've got sensory, and, and we're trying to get that message to and from as quickly as possible. And so um, that happens in the periphery. We can understand it in the periphery, but we also have communication in the brain. The white matter tracts in the brain are going to be affected, which means that you're not going to have good communication between cortical regions, you're not going to have good communication also in the basal ganglia. So it's going to affect central nervous system function and it's going to affect um, motor control. Okay, so myelin increases the speed. Uh, multiple sclerosis is it's a uh, it's destruction, autoimmune destruction of myelin coating on the axons primarily affects oligodendrocytes of the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord. So it's primarily there. Remember with GPS, that was it was mainly peripheral. Uh, demyelinating or sclerotic patches develop through white matter of the central nervous system, decreases conduction velocity and conduction and, and may block conduction completely. So you've got white matter tracks going up and down the spinal cord, you've got them in the brain. All of those uh, can potentially be affected. So autoimmune mechanism that targets myelin producing cells, perhaps myelin proteins. Um, so I think they've done studies that shows that, that that show that the antibodies are actually attacking myelin and getting rid of myelin. Uh, T cell mediated demyelination of nerve fibers in the white matter of the brain, spinal cord, and the optic nerve. So uh, that's one of the first things that's affected as well. Um, is the optic nerve, which can cause vision problems, characterized by formation of sclerotic plaques seen on an MRI, which is what this is trying to show you, that darkened area. It's supposed to be white matter, but it's getting darker because the myelin is being destroyed. Okay, so results in conduction abnormality. Symptoms vary depending on location and extent of lesions. Optic neuritis with visual field changes, speech and swallowing issues, muscle strength, gait and coordination, balance, and eye movement. All of these things are just muscle problems, are all are neuro, <laughs> neuromuscular problems. You're not able to get the signal to the muscle that you want it to at the right time. So whether that originates in the central nervous system from the basal ganglia trying to coordinate it all, or whether it's the track going to it, somehow you're not able to, to do those. And everybody is going to present a little bit differently and at different times. But usually one of the first things you see is this optic neuritis. Okay, so that, that tends to happen uh, fairly early on. All right, with, with multiple sclerosis. All right, so spinal cord injury. Well, I think we all understand what a spinal cord injury is. It's where you injure your spinal cord. 
includes fractions, dislocations, and subluxation, which is a which is a misalignment. So you could have a misalignment, which is going to affect function of the spinal cord. Spinal cord injuries are a lot more interesting than um, than we normally think, because usually when we think spinal cord injury, oh, we broke the spinal cord, it's broken, we we can't have communication anymore. That's usually not the way a spinal cord injury takes place. Sometimes uh, you have you have a, a complete severing of the spinal cord, but usually it's some kind of a partial injury. And and so we're going to kind of go through a, a few of those. Let's see, did I say everything I wanted to? Most injuries result from some combination of compressive, rotational, or bending movement. Okay, and then this guy, I don't know, is having a bad day. All right, so um, acute spinal cord injury, damage to the neural elements of the spinal cord. Okay. All right, so let's look at this. Sudden transection, so that means we've, we've cut it co through completely, of the spinal cord results in a loss of motor, sensory, and reflex, and autonomic function. We've lost everything. We're going to break down that autonomic function in a minute. But, but you've lost all of these. Motor sensory, you, you've lost reflexes and autonomic function below the level of the injury, right? Because that makes sense. Because these neurons up here, they don't know what happened down here. Okay, but these guys are done. Okay, this is supposed to be a spinal cord and then your brain is up here. Okay, so these guys are fine, but these guys are not. And so anything below that point, all these spinal nerves that are coming out of here are no longer getting they're no longer able to send a signal it's just not getting to the brain and the brain's not able to control that uh, that behavior okay all right so characterized by oh 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 spinal shock spinal shock is interesting so there was someone who was in a car accident and fractured his second vertebrae and his c2 and which can kill you but um in this case, he was going to pick up his phone to call 911, and he could not move. Okay? And so, of course, he thought he was paralyzed. But what he had was a spinal cord shock, okay? and that's regardless of the level of the lesion. So what happens is flaccid paralysis with loss of tendon reflexes. Okay? So your spinal cord is not, so you've lost reflexes, so lower motor neurons are affected as well. Absence of somatic and visceral sensations, you can't feel anything. Loss of bowel and bladder function, okay, because now you're getting down into the, the uh, lower thoracic or the, the lumbar and the sacral areas. Uh, loss of system, systemic sympathetic vasomotor tone, okay, so what does that mean? That means you can't vasodilate anymore. Uh, may result in uh, hypo or you can't vasoconstrict, sorry. So if you can't vasoconstrict, then that means that because the sympathetic nervous system, okay, so here's our blood vessel. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Okay, actually it causes vaso, vasoconstriction and then when it when you have less activation, it, it vasodilates. Okay. So in this case, you've lost, okay, you've lost your ability to vasoconstrict and so you have vasodilation. Okay, remember distributive shock with sepsis and anaphylaxis, that's the same thing that happened except it wasn't from a spinal cord injury obviously, but you have that massive vasodilation which is going to cause decreased blood pressure or hypotension. Okay, so I hope that I hope that makes sense. The thing that you may not be aware of is that the sympathetic nervous system uh, has to be activated to cause that vasoconstriction, okay? And then when it's when it's deactivated, it causes vasodilation, and that's normal all the time. It's, it's kind of turning itself up and down, or the brain is usually controlling that with feedback, okay? Uh, but in this case, the blocked signal is going to cause, could cause vasodilation. Spinal cord shock may last for hours, which is the case in this person I was talking about, uh, days, or, or it could last for weeks. So a lot of times somebody gets a spinal cord injury and you don't know how much of their uh, how much they're going to get back. So resolution is return of reflexes. 
Okay, so spinal cord anatomy plays a role in spinal cord injury. More information is carried primarily on the ventral side. So if we, if we look, let's think about what that says. Spinal cord anatomy, so what's spinal cord anatomy? That means that you have different tracts going up and down in different places carrying different information. So if we break that down just a little bit, we can see motor information is carried primarily on the ventral side of the spinal cord, which is kind of the front area, but you can also see that there's some uh, balance information that's kind of in a little more, um, what are we saying, ventral dorsal. Um, so that's a little more dorsal. Sensory information is carried primarily on the lateral or dorsal side of the spinal cord. Okay, so you can, you, if you look at the pictures, there's really no way to, I mean, there is a way I had to do it in neuroanatomy, but there's really no need to just sort of memorize all of these tracks and, and where they're going and what information they're bringing. The thing is, so we'll base it on, um, on the pathologies because there, but the thing to remember is that there's a lot of different things going on and a lot of different tracks. And so if you don't have a complete uh, transection of the spinal cord, you're going to affect some of these more than others, and it's really going to vary. Okay, so uh, pain and temperature information crosses over immediately. That's going to come back in a second when we talk about something because pain and temperature information crosses over immediately. So if you cut it up here, well, you're going to lose pain on the pain, um, pain and temperature on the opposite side. Okay. Um, Meanwhile, some things like touch goes all the way up and doesn't cross over till it gets in the medulla, which means that if you cut it up here, you're going to lose touch perception on the same side. So there's a lot of there are a lot of different ways that uh, these symptoms can can express in in uh, someone with a uh, partial spinal cord injury. All right. So we're going to go through a few of these and we're going to name them. So central cord syndrome and really this is We'll expand on this, but this is really kind of the, uh, they're pretty descriptive in a way. So central cord syndrome, central gray or white matter, arms are more affected than the legs. This is when the uh, central part of the cord is damaged. So if, if arms are more affected than the legs, then what information do you think is carried more in the central part of the spinal cord? Probably arms or upper body. Uh, anterior cord syndrome, okay, well, I don't know how descriptive that is. Anterior section of the cord, which is going to affect motor functions more, uh, touch sense is not affected. So now you have a situation, a syndrome, which you have loss of motor, but not necessarily touch. We're going to go through these again, so I don't want to say too much yet. Uh, brown Saquard syndrome, one side of the cord is damaged which means that now you can lose motor function on that side, but pain and temperature, remember, because it crossed over right away, pain and temperature sensation is lost from the other side. Okay? So you can feel stuff over here. So, you know, if, if the side that you can feel pain on is, uh, um, you know, you, you can feel pain on the side that you can't control the muscle. So it's like, ouch, that hot, that's hot, but I can't move away from it because I, I can't don't have motor function control on that side. Okay, and we'll we'll talk more about that if that didn't make any sense. Okay, so central cord. So let's talk about central cord syndrome first. So these are partial injuries. Okay. Partial. Okay, so fibers in the corticospinal, so we, we're not naming these necessarily, but corticospinal means from the cortex, brain cortex to the spinal cord. Controlling the arms are located more centrally, so central cord syndrome, than those controlling the legs. So that means that when you have damage to the central gray or white matter, central meaning exactly what we're saying, central, central, center, okay? So damage to the central gray or white matter of the spinal cord results in loss of motor function in the upper extremities and minimal or no loss of function in the lower extremities. Okay, so that's a syndrome. That's a unique uh, set of behaviors. That's a unique um, set of uh, manifestations, expression of, of this. So it occurs almost exclusively in the cervical spinal cord, which makes sense because because that's where the upper um, the spinal nerves come out to control the upper upper neurons or the uh, upper limbs. Okay, so anterior cord syndrome. This is, this one's a little, a little more complicated, I guess. 
Uh, damage to the anterior, so front two-thirds of the spinal cord, usually caused by infarction of the anterior spinal artery. Okay, so that means that we've lost blood flow to the anterior part of the spinal cord. Um, so you have loss of motor function provided by the corticospinal tracts, loss of pain and temperature sensation from damage to the lateral spinal thalamic tracts. So all this is saying is that because you've damaged the front two-thirds, the anterior two-thirds of it, that that information, let's see, if we look at this, that information, pain and temperature, are carried in that area, and motor is carried in that area. Okay. Most motor is carried in that area. So obviously that's what you're going to lose. And so these are these are the uh, the manifestations, how that's going to uh, be presented. So the posterior to one third of the spinal cord is not affected, which means you still have position, vibration, and touch, uh, sense of touch. Those are going to be unaffected. You're just losing motor and temperature sensation. Okay, brown saquard syndrome, damage to a partial section of the anterior and posterior cord. So, so we're talking about really damaging half of the spinal cord. Okay, obviously it's not always going to be exactly half, but that's that's the uh, the set of behaviors of the set of um, manifestations that we see. So, damage to partial section of the anterior and posterior, loss of voluntary motor control on the same side as the cord damage, and we can we can kind of see this here. Well, this is just showing touch and pain and temperature, but in, if you if you have information coming in from this side, so you have motor information moving into that neuron, and then it goes up, and then it will cross over in the in the brainstem. Okay, so motor or it's going the opposite direction. So motor information is going to cross over, and then it's going to come down, and then it's going to innervate whatever, whatever it's trying to innervate. Pain, okay, so that's voluntary motor control. Okay. So information coming down, it's crossing over, comes down. Oh, I thought I changed colors. You might already get this, but nonetheless. And then you have, let's see, so then you have information going out. I don't know if I did that right. But but if you have damage, then you're going to lose motor control on the same side. However, information coming in, so I'm, I'm doing my, my motor in my, and I doubt anybody cares, but they might. So then you have information coming in for pain, or I'm sorry, pain and temperature, and then it's going to go up on the opposite side. So when you damage this, you're you, you've lost muscle control, or well, if you only damage half of it, you lose muscle control on one side, but yet you still have your pain. Your pain sensation is still just fine because it's going up over here. So even though you've damaged it here, however, pain information from that side is gone. So you've lost pain over here. No motor. No. Okay. So you have motor on this side. Yes, pain, yes, okay. okay, so that's brown Sequard syndrome. Okay, um, so I think, I think the main thing is to remember that you have um, motor and pain sensation can be, can be different with this disease, okay. All right, I'm not going to make you explain all of that. Hopefully on an exam won't make it too confusing. I hope. I never promise because I never know. Okay, so complete spinal cord injury. They work. Uh, damage to the upper motor neurons, uh, T12 and above. Uh, spinal reflexes still work, but they're no longer modulated by the brain. So that's upper motor neurons. Okay. Damage to lower motor neurons. Cells in spinal reflex arcs are damaged, which means that... Um, you've you you have that flaccid paralysis okay so we already we already kind of went over that upper motor neurons versus lower motor neurons so a couple of i guess a couple of other things to throw in here um, if you have an injury in the c1 to c4 you potentially lose diaphragm uh, muscle function which means that 
um, you're not going to be able to breathe. Okay, so so that's a lot of times damage to the to the upper cervical neurons are not are not survivable uh, because there are so many vital functions that are controlled up there in the upper spinal cord and the uh, and the brainstem, which those are kind of covering up. Uh, T6, so we might um, let's see. T6 trunk and oh at or below this is the this is the other one that I think is important at or below the first sacral spinal nerve you're going to lose bladder function okay because that's um, that's parasympathetic control down there okay so uh, and we can remember that from the uh, urinary system so or the bladder pathophys and we'll talk about it in the next slide a little bit too. So sudden traumatic complete transection of spinal cord results in flaccid paralysis. Okay, so we already we already mentioned that. Okay. Now, the last two slides, autonomic disruption. Neuronal damage can lead to problems with autonomic nervous system function. Okay, so autonomic nervous system is sympathetic and parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is your rest and digest. Okay, so you're going to have to make some guesses. If I activate the parasympathetic nervous system, is my heart rate going to go up or down? It's probably going to go down. That's a rest type of function. Am I going to urinate if I activate my parasympathetic nervous system? Rest and digest? Well, yes, it also counts for urination. So we can see, now this is the thing to look at now that we're actually looking at the spinal cord again, and I know we went over this in bladder and urinary. You can see that there are cranial nerves up here that are going to activate parasympathetic functions. So you can see that it's going to the lungs, and we talked about some of this, you know, the constriction of the, of the smooth muscle in the bronchi, which is going to allow more air in or, more, or, or not allow it. Um, because of fight or flight, if you, this is rest and digest, which means that you can close those muscles a little bit in the in the um, bronchi because you don't need an open airway when you're resting and digesting, I guess. Um, it's going to activate the GI stuff, okay? Musculature, moving things forward, motility, all of that's um, going to be activated by the parasympathetic. Okay, but right now I want you to look at the location. So parasympathetic, you've got these these cranial nerves clear up here in the brainstem, and then you have a few down here in the sacral area. Okay, so this is this is kind of kind of important um, because that's where the division is. Because now when we're talking about spinal cord injury, that's kind of going to make a difference as for a whole lot of things because that's what the autonomic nervous system is doing. It doesn't just affect one thing and pick and choose. It affects all of these things and and it does it, it's it's supposed to be efficient, but with a spinal cord injury, it can cause some real problems. Okay, so sympathetic fight or flight. Note that the upper thoracic neurons control heart and lungs. So these guys up here are going to affect these heart and lungs a little more. Down here in the lower thoracic, you've got a lot of other things being affected. The GI system, the adrenal gland is down here, which is going to release more adrenaline when you have it a sympathetic response. That's what we call an adrenaline res response, a fight or flight response. So it's going to activate, which means that it's going to really cause vasoconstriction to a lot of these places. That's what the sy sy sympathetic nervous system does, is that it's all of these areas, it considers these less important, or your body does in general. It's not something you want to have active when you're uh, in a fight or flight situation. You don't want to be producing, you don't want to urinate, but you don't want to do that. You don't want GI function to be as active. And so it's going to cause vasoconstriction. You don't want blood flow to these major areas. And so what happens when the sympathetic nervous system is active, and I hope you're kind of paying attention to this right now, is that it causes this massive vasoconstriction because it wants to redirect that that blood flow to the to the muscles. Okay, so it, want, it doesn't it doesn't do it, but that means that more blood is available to your skeletal muscles, so you can run away. Okay, is the general the general idea. Okay, so the lower thoracic control GI and adrenal gland, and the lumbar controls 
the bladder. So that's going to, so the sympathetic nervous system is going to um, prevent urination. Okay. Okay. So that goes back to the uh, urinary bladder section. So there's this thing called autonomic dysreflexia. And this is kind of confusing, but but really not not necessarily. So if you if you can kind of imagine that you have a spinal cord injury up, I'm going to go back for a second. You have a spinal cord injury that kind of occurs up in this area. Okay. okay. So that means that the brain now is not able to communicate. So let's say, okay, and now now this is the thing that you that you may not be thinking about yet, but take my word for it. There is an there is autonomic reflexes. Okay, which means that if something triggers the sympathetic nervous system here, then the sympathetic nervous system will activate and it will cause massive vasoconstriction and it will shut these things down. So anything, a full bladder could activate the sympathetic nervous system and then the sympathetic nervous system will activate all over the place. Okay, Why doesn't this happen all the time? Because we get signals back to the sympathetic nervous system and then we have reflex types of behaviors. It doesn't happen all the time because the brain can override it. And the brain can say, no, we're not going to vasoconstrict everything in the entire body. It says, calm down, sympathetic nervous system, we're fine. There's a lot more going on that you don't know about. Well, in this case, stay. In this case, there is no more communication. So it's like a child. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is almost like a child that just doesn't know what to do, and it's kind of overreacting. And we and we call that autonomic dysreflexia. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system may have a reflex response if triggered by some kind of stimulus, a full bladder or rectum, pain, even if it's not sensed by the patient, if there's any kind of pain trigger, it could cause this vasoconstriction. Uh, any kind of visceral contractions may, may cause it. Okay, So it kind of overreacts. So neur neuron neuronal damage above T6 means that the brain cannot get that signal to regulate that reflex response. You, so you've cut off this critical area, and now this, the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system is kind of working without a parent, okay? So it's an exaggerated sympathetic reflex and it kind of, and it, and it makes sense. So priority, and this is why it's a problem, dangerous rise in blood pressure because of vasoconstriction. Think back to your distributive shock, which was vasodilation, that shock drop in blood pressure. Now we have massive vasoconstriction and so there is a dangerous rise in blood pressure. The heart rate is slow. Why? Why would the heart rate be slow? Well, because the parasympathetic, where did it come from? Cranial nerves. That was the vagus nerve. Comes from clear up here. It's, it's fine. Okay. And what does it do? This is, this is where it gets interesting. So what happens when it senses that there's massive it doesn't know why there's vasoconstriction, okay, maybe, but there's vasoconstriction. There's an increase in blood pressure. So what's your parasympathetic going to do? It's going to do its job, and it's going to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, and it's going to slow the heart rate. That's kind of, a, uh, that's kind of an interesting little um, contradiction there. So now we have dangerously high blood pressure and a slow heart rate. Okay, because the parasympathetic is try it's detecting the high blood pressure, it's trying to lower it. Um, so the heart rate is slow because the parasympathetic is intact and trying to lower blood pressure, but it can't tell the sympathetic to stop the vasoconstriction. Okay, so that's that's some of these responses. Anyway, we call that autonomic dysreflexia, and uh, and it kind of and it kind of makes sense. Okay, this has been a really long lecture, and I didn't want it to be. I apologize, but uh, the last thing are just some terms, and you can you can look at those on your own. Uh, have a good time.